scanning. Your brain is constantly scanning you as a female. Are you safe enough and healthy enough to reproduce? Doesn't matter if you want to. I don't want to. But that's what my brain is constantly scanning for. What do you like? Tell me what you like. There's value in that because it almost gives the brain like a vacation, right? Holistic health is completely underappreciated, but so critical. Eating whole foods and the key is just to find something that you really enjoy. Welcome to the NAMP Nourishing You podcast. I'm Kristen Burkett. And I'm Diana Wally. We're your hosts for NAMP's podcast dedicated to connecting holistic health enthusiasts with each other to share practical information from the holistic wellness space for enhanced vitality. Diana and I are master nutrition therapists, board certified in holistic nutrition with private practices and an online joint venture that supports clients and practitioners as they strive to reach their full potential. We're honored to be hosting this podcast for NAMP and connecting our listeners with the latest in holistic wellness. If you enjoyed today's show, help us out by commenting below, liking this video, and subscribing to the channel to help us spread the word. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Nourishing You podcast. We're beyond excited today to welcome Dr. Carrie Jones to talk about the underappreciated love hormone oxytocin. Dr. Jones is an internationally recognized speaker, consultant, and educator on the topic of women's health and hormones. Dr. Jones graduated from National University in Portland, Oregon as a naturopathic physician and went on to complete a two-year residency in women's health, hormones, and endocrinology to become board certified in naturopathic endocrinology. Later, she graduated from Grand Canyon University's Master of Public Health program. Dr. Jones was one of the first to become board certified through the American Board of Naturopathic Endocrinology and currently serves on the board. She was the medical director for the Dutch test for several years and is the clinical expert for the SOS Stress Recover Program and for the Lifestyle Matrix Resource Center and serves on Under Armour's Council on Human Performance. She has over 17 years of experience in the field of functional and integrative medicine and is currently the head of medical education at Rupa Health. Welcome, Dr. Jones. We can't wait to dig into this topic with you today. Thanks for joining us. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. So Carrie, Kristen and I have followed your work for several years now and have learned so much about women's health and hormones through the education you provided. So we first of all wanted to thank you so much for that. Oh, oh my gosh, I so appreciate that. I absolutely it's definitely my passion. Yeah, and your Instagram is the best. So for all of the <laughs> listeners out there, it's at, at Dr. Carrie Jones. Is that right? Yeah, at, yep, at, at Dr. Yeah. Carrie Jones. Mm -hmm. At the Hormone Savvy Doc. But it, it's so informative, so relatable, but hilarious. And <laughs> I don't know how you keep a straight face when you're doing some of these posts because I'm cracking up. Like, I don't know how you do that. I, well, I think I'm hysterical, right? So I keep make, I make these reels and I and I show my husband. I'm like, look, see, see, aren't I aren't I funny? He's like, uh huh, sure, babe. <laughs> no, you are, you are. I've showed my family. I'm like, you guys got to see this one, yeah. So, so if you're not following her at Dr. Carrie Jones, it's it's a kick. Um, so to kick things off, we really want to get to know you a little better. So will you share how you came into the field of holistic health, and then also we want to know about your new role at Rupa Health. Absolutely. So I have known since I was a little girl that I wanted to be in medicine and I thought maybe OBGYN or maybe pediatrics. And honestly, so I was raised in the South. I wasn't born in the South, but I was raised in the South in Lexington, Kentucky. And I have told this story before because it's just so funny to me. It was our football coach who taught us health, um, health class. You know, we would help, we would all have health class. And I thought, why is our elderly football coach teaching all the women in the room about health? So you can imagine how my foray into health started out. Fast forward, when I was uh, in college, I was volunteering at a hospital that did a lot of community outreach. And I realized that's what I love to do. I wanted to educate. I wanted to empower because not only did I learn pretty much nothing from a, health, a football coach, a lot of people in the community I happened to be in didn't know much about diet, nutrition. They were struggling with diabetes and nobody had taught them high blood pressure. Nobody had taught them. And so I was headed to medical school, conventional medical school. And I thought, this isn't for me. I don't know what's for me, but it's not this route. I can't do drugs and surgery all day. Absolutely a time and a place, not what I wanted to do. 
And that's where I found naturopathic medicine, went into naturopathic medical school, fell in love with hormones and women's health, and then um, continued on through there. Did my residency in that. I practiced for many years, seeing patients for uh, women's health and hormonal issues and worked for the Dutch test, which is a functional medicine hormone test. And now, as you said, I were in the head of education at Rupa Health. So it's been a really fun, super educational journey for me. But, you know, I realized a long time ago that education on health, as, as you two know, uh, is just really lacking. <laughs> it's lacking all around. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of misunderstanding out there. And so that's why uh, I like to make really funny, relatable Instagram reels, because I know if I'm going through it, other people are going through it. Um, but also help educate and empower at the same time. Ah, that's that's an interesting story. I don't think I've ever heard that story before. I don't. Oh, <laughs> maybe I've listened to the wrong podcast in the past, but that's really that's really neat how you got here. And mm -hmm. it's awesome that you found naturopathic medicine. I was on that same path to be a doctor, and was like, it wasn't for me. Ended up in a different direction, but I really didn't know anything about naturopathic medicine to even explore that option. So. We're all so yeah. glad that you did and grateful that you ended up where you did. And so thank you. And really, when do you sleep? Because when I see all these reels that you do, all these different podcasts that you're interviewed on, the role that you must play in your actual job, do you actually sleep? <laughs> I do. Yes, I do. My, uh, yes, my husband and my dog make, make certain that um, we go to bed on time. But thankfully, I've been really lucky that my uh, job at Dutch and my job at Rupa involves education, social media. And so I get to build it into my day to oh, get nice. that out there, which is um, fantastic. I feel very lucky. Oh, that's great. Well, for our topic today, we're going to do a little shift on the usual hormone focus. I think most of us that are listening to, they're listening and are used to listening to you and watching your reels and those and the different education you put out there is typically focused on more of the estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, stress relationships, all of these things, which are always great conversations. But we wanted to take a dive into an important but probably overlooked hormone called oxytocin. And just to clarify, we're not talking about the pain medica medication OxyContin. We're talking about <laughs> the hormone oxytocin. So could you start us off by telling us a little bit about this hormone, which I think is also a neurotransmitter? Maybe. It is a neurotransmitter. Um, yeah. yeah uh, and so how is it made? How is it used in the body? Give us sort of the lowdown on that. Yeah. So it's made in the brain. Um, and so your part of your brain called the hypothalamus tells part of your pituitary to put out oxytocin. And a lot of people are familiar with oxytocin. It's like our love hormone or our bonding hormone. Um, maybe mothers who have breastfed feel they're like, oh my gosh, when I breastfeed and look down at my baby, I just get this rush of emotion. I feel so attached and bonded. That's oxytocin. That's oxytocin's role. But the really neat thing is that oxytocin can increase with, with love and affection and you know bonding through a lot of other ways. It's not just reserved for somebody who was breastfeeding. And we like oxytocin because it immediately helps us shift out of that fight, flight, flee feeling. Like all, when we are, we're all stressed and, you know, our shoulders are up and we're not sleeping and maybe we're feeling anxious and a lot's going on. So it pulls us out of that, at least temporarily, and puts us into our rest, digest, and heal. So the purpose of oxytocin definitely uh, serves a huge function for the, for the breastfeeding mother. Um, but in the everyday person, doesn't matter, male or female, oxytocin serves a really big role in feeling bonded, feeling attached, and reducing our stress levels. So it's a super important hormone. So is it, so you said men produce it too, which is mm -hmm. interesting. Does it work yes. differently in men? It doesn't. It works okay. just about the same, which is really nice. And in fact, I had read years ago, a study that was talking about men and oxytocin. And the one of the reasons they feel um, that uh, oxytocin increases in men, especially after the birth of a baby, is to keep the man attached and bonded to the family unit so that they will stay and protect. Because the mother's focus in, in this study that they were talking about, so from a like biologic standpoint, the mother's focus is on They've just delivered a baby and they, now they need to feed, nourish, and grow this baby. 
where so then the father was oxytocin would increase for bonding purposes to in theory keep them there and then protect the family and i thought that was really really interesting but men's oxytocin can go up for the same reasons that women's go up it doesn't have to be breastfeeding it can be other um significant you know moments um around like love or touching or hugging etc that that increase it so that whole connection to the stress response makes a whole, a whole lot of sense as to why like if you've got if you've had a bad day or something's happened and you go in and your spouse gives you a hug all of a sudden That's you so just true. it's like relief and you yeah. feel better and there's actually a hormone that's part of that whole thing. Yeah. I've, I have often, um, when I was in practice, I had, um, I would see patients in person is it back, back then telemedicine wasn't really a thing. So in, I would have these sheets of, um, kind of like a treatment plan and some of it was pre-typed out for them about like staying hydrated or movement, um, mindset. And at the very last thing I said was to pet a dog. And I often actually say this when I lecture at the end of my, like, the last thing to leave the audience with when I lecture. So I always say pet a dog, make sure it's a nice dog, make sure you're not allergic to dogs. Um, mm -hmm. And you can substitute in a nice cat. I've had people ask me about their birds, you know, their hamster, whatever. <laughs> but the act of petting your dog, loving your dog, that unconditional love that your animal gives back to you raises oxytocin. So a number of people would say, why do I feel better when my dog snuggles with me? Why do I automatically feel safer? Why do I feel happier when my cat is purring and on my lap? And I said, oxytocin. You're, that's driving up your oxytocin. You feel bonded. You feel attached. You feel safe. Oxytocin is a big hormone for safety. Uh, and of course, not a lot of people feel safe in their life. And so to get these glimpses, these moments of increased oxytocin, feeling of bonded and safety can really mean a lot and go a long way with the stress response. So I have kind of a two-part question and, and really sort of expanding on what you were just saying. So I'm curious, how important is oxytocin for fostering healthy relationships with our partner, children, friends, so on? Yeah. And then the second part would be, because we have a lot of practitioners listening, should we be thinking about oxytocin with our clients and our patients? Yes. <laughs> yes. And okay. yes. How's okay. that? Okay. Yes. And so um, with the, actually I can answer that. I think I can answer both parts of the question all in one. So I would imagine now in this day and age, uh, a lot of our clients come in and they are 10 out of 10 stressed, whether they want to admit it or not, they're telling you their story and you're like, I know you're stressed. Like you can try to hide it, but I'm pretty certain you're stressed or you get their lab work back and you're like, yep, see, told you, you have a lot going on. So if we can get our oxytocin to increase, it will help a myriad of symptoms that our patients are coming in with. It, it may not be the full, qu quote, cure behind it, but it will definitely, definitely help. If your oxytocin goes up and you feel loved, bonded, attached, safe, even if it's just for a couple of minutes, but you haven't felt that all day, that can go a really long way time after time after time again. So everybody's searching for a pill, right? Everybody's searching for, I have anxiety. Uh, I don't feel safe. I'm stressed out. What pill can I take? And this is, I love oxytocin because it's free, cheap, and easy. It's let's find ways to increase your oxytocin and get you those feelings again so you feel less stressed, less anxious, more safe. So yes, it is important for practitioners and just for people in their relationships. We all know people who are maybe not in um, the greatest of relationships and you know their oxytocin is not increased. And we know how important it is for children's growth to have that bonding attachment, feelings of safety so that they can grow up to be well-adjusted adults. So yes, to your question. I think I remember from, I don't know, a long time ago, maybe it was when I was first studying nutrition therapy, a connection between oxytocin and why sometimes babies in orphanages have a really difficult time bonding later in life is because the lack of touch uh, yes. in those situations and how critical that is in those first developing years to have a lot of touch and that oxytocin. Yes. Yeah. In fact, they even say, I think it's even shorter. I think it's in the developing like days and weeks. Like if they don't get that uh, touch uh, from somebody who they feel safe with, even as a newborn baby, 
um, then it, it can lead to um, a number of struggles later in life. And, you know, we, we hear this as practitioners. We have adults who come in to see us. And as they're telling us their story around their anxiety or their codependency, um, their depression, their panic attacks, when you learn of their upbringing and you realize that they maybe didn't grow up in a household that was loving, that was safe, maybe there was a lot of trauma, you can see the correlation in our adult patients looking back going, oh my goodness, what a disservice that your, your upbringing, your, your family, your parents, your mom, your dad, whatever, um, your grandparents, whoever it was that raised you, because it, it really can manifest is as those symptoms in our adult life. Yeah, that's, and, and there's, that's heartbreaking. Right, you know, it's heartbreaking there. And there's that great book, um, the body keeps score. Have you read the book? The body, right? Like it's yes. phenomenal. And it, it talks about that a lot. And I, I'm seeing it more on social media in love or hate social media. I absolutely get it. I think some of the bonuses of it are people who have been struggling for a long time, not maybe they don't have the budget to afford a therapist, a counselor, a practitioner, but they're seeing some of this, this snippet information on social media and they're going, oh, oh that explains a lot. Like that's me or I'm, you know, now I'm going to seek help because now I can put two together or I'm going to buy that book because it seems like that probably would fit my life. And so I am seeing more and more on social media of people who are realizing childhood stuff, infant stuff as it's manifesting, it's taking them through their whole life. And now as an adult, you know, they're having, they're struggling. Yeah. And one thing I, I'm, pretty sure it was you that I heard that I was listening to a webinar or something you're talking about oxytocin and how it made me um, change things in my practice was if I have an elderly person that lives alone, or even if it's a younger person that doesn't have a, a partner or spouse, um, is to recommend massage or mm -hmm. pedicures or manicures mm -hmm. and not so much for the direct stress reduction, but for the oxytocin production, mm -hmm. which then could impact the stress. But it's interesting to see then how that makes them feel if you're not getting touched. Mm -hmm. And maybe you haven't as a child, even those small things could be a big deal, which may not be a yeah. big deal to us if where we have a partner or somebody to hug, you know, or yeah. a dog to pet. Right. So it's a good question to ask, yeah. ask your, your patients and clients, you know, yeah. do you get regular hugs? <laughs> you know, yeah, do you, yeah. do you feel, you know, do you feel safe? Do you have someone that makes you feel loved? And it doesn't have to be a lover. It could absolutely be, you know, your roommate's fantastic. Your best friend lives down the street yeah. where you feel just like uh, you have a good community, right? Yeah. You have, you have that, you know, yes, I have somebody that when I see them, I hug them and I get very excited and they, we check in on each other because unfortunately, I think the last couple of years we have found a lot of people, um, who weren't allowed to leave the house, uh, and there was, they, they lived alone and really, really struggled. We know mental health really took a dive for a lot of reasons, but a big one is they just had no interaction, none. And when you take interaction away from people, I mean, it's devastating. It can really, really ruin their mental health. Yeah, absolutely. So is oxytocin similar to other hormones in the body that might decline with age? Is there anything happens there Ooh. or is it something that just always regenerates when you, <laughs> it, you know, when you need it most? I actually yeah. don't know. I don't know that I've ever read oxytocin declines. I mean, I read, you know, estrogen declines, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA. We read this all the time. I actually don't know that I've ever read the decline. Like when you hit menopause, ox oxytocin goes down. I think you can continue to regenerate it, but I will have to actually look that up physiologically. Yeah. All right. And what about relationship with other hormones? Like does oxytocin interact with other hormones in our body? Like if it's low, does something else suffer or does it kind of just work on its own? Um, no, uh, I mean, of course we all know that our, our body's like a, like a spider web, right? If you, if you pluck one string, the whole web vibrates. So yes, if oxytocin is low, it can definitely, um, have a negative impact on our estrogen, progesterone hormones, our, you know, um, even our cycle health. So let's, here's a great example, stress. We've been talking about stress. When you have a lot of stress, you tend to have uh, cortisol. You will have adrenaline, which is known as epinephrine, noradrenaline known as norepinephrine. Uh, so you have re feedback receptors in your brain. Your brain is constantly scanning you as a female. Are you safe enough and healthy enough to reproduce? Doesn't matter if you want to. I don't want to, but that's what my brain is constantly scanning for. 
So now I have lots of cortisol. I have lots of adrenaline in my body. It goes up to the brain and the brain says, oh, now is not a good time to ovulate or to make appropriate levels of progesterone or to keep her cycle normal, you know, typical, expected. We're going to throw the whole system off. So now I am left with not only stress symptoms, but hormonal symptoms as well. Maybe my cycle is skipped. My cycle is long. Period is heavy. PMS is worse because my brain is trying to protect me. Now, if oxytocin is low, that can only that's going to worsen the situation. Now, um, I'm being uh, being the nerd that I am. I know that if I not only do things for my stress response, try to lower my stress response as best as I can. Even now, we you know people talk about breathing exercises or meditations or certain supplements, herbs that are good for stress. But I know oxytocin, just raising oxytocin, having that feeling of love and joy and safety will immediately help. And so I tell people, in fact, I have it on my sign here behind me, healing happens at joy. I tell people just it's the little joyful moments in your day. It doesn't have to be all day. It doesn't have to be an hour, but they build on each other. And so if you have no joy then you're not going to get that oxytocin if you're not going to feel safe, um, love. And so it's, it is going to eventually affect your stress response and your hormonal um, rhythm. And so it's very tied together for all of us. Oh, that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. And I think it's just something we don't think about. And I think we all know just at an innate level that it's good to hug, it's good to touch, it's good to feel connected. But I think sometimes we underestimate the impact that it has mm -hmm. on our physiology, like mm -hmm. at a real biochemical level that it does change things. It's not just, oh yeah, I feel good. It's yeah, I feel yeah. good. Like there's <laughs> more to it than that. So yeah. Yeah. yeah very interesting. So and there's a difference between like hugging, like just hugging your friend and then like a hug. You know, when somebody gives yeah. you like a good hugger, you know, you're like, oh, it feels so good. And it's just raising that oxytocin and makes you feel safe and secure. And that's a, like a moment where you flip into that um, rest, digest and heal, which is great. So you touched on it a couple minutes ago about things that have gone on in this in our world over the last couple of years <laughs> with the pandemic and how it's potentially affected overall production of oxytocin in us as humans, I think just in general, as a world. Mm -hmm. uh, so people that live alone, had it affect them in one way or another, but then we've got, you know, family units that maybe had too much time together. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Are you yes. looking at me? Are you looking at <laughs> my kids are like, ah, I'm looking at the mirror here. No. <laughs> I don't know. But so many different situations that none of us have had to, you know, be a part of before. Right. Can we let's talk about some of those specifically so that our audience might relate to, yeah, that's that's been my world. This has been my world and how it might have affected them. And then we can talk about what we can do to overcome any deficits that we might have incurred during that time. Yeah. Well, look at the speaking of the the pandemic, look at the number of animals that were adopted. You know, as soon as everyone worked from home, everyone yes. went and adopted an animal. Yes. Which originally, when I would read when I would read stories about this, a lot of the adopt ed, animal adoptions were because okay, I work from home. Now I will have time to walk a dog or you know be with the animal or what have you, and not expecting the outcome of, oh my gosh, this animal, dog or cat, whatever they adopted, did wonders for my mental health. I mean, the amount of videos and testimonies and things that I saw online from people who were like this animal saved my life and didn't even realize it. I was just adopting because I was finally work from home. And it turned out, uh, you know, thank goodness I had another being in the house to get me up, make me responsible, get me moving. And oh, by the way, showed me unconditional love. So I felt mentally so much better through the pandemic. And I think that's just one way. Um, it's, it's a, it's a good, um, it's a good, you know, tribute to the mental health, uh, the way that the pandemic effect affected a lot of people's mental health. And then on the way opposite side of the spectrum are the people who live alone and um, weren't able to see loved ones, you know, their families, their friends. Uh, maybe they used to work in a building. Now they're work from home by themselves. 
And it was really, I mean, it makes for, it can make for a really lonely feeling and it can make for, and meanwhile, they're also feeling very unsafe. Like the world, everything was kind of in chaos for a long time. So you feel lonely and you're at home by yourself and you're feeling unsafe. We know as practitioners, it's been all over the news, the rates of depression and anxiety, insomnia through the roof, through the roof or worse, you know, God forbid worse. And so uh, understanding that, um, you know, maybe for the, for a, an extreme introvert, it was a dream come true, but for a lot of people, it really shined a big spotlight on the fact that they didn't have a community to fall back on or somebody in their household to feel safe with or get that oxytocin uh, boost through just normal, healthy ways, whether it was with another person or, you know, with an animal. And so I, as a practitioner, knowing this about mental health and hormones, it was really eye-opening watching all the news reports and honestly watching all the, a lot of the videos and stories and stuff that came out of social media from people. Um, so if somebody's listening to this going, oh my gosh, that was me, 100%, like you were not alone. You were, it affected a lot of people. Well, and before you tell us how we can increase oxytocin, <laughs> do you think that that a Zoom call, a phone call, can we get oxytocin from something like that? So it's definitely not the same. Okay. You know, it, we all did it, yeah, right? We yeah. all we all FaceTime and Zoom, yeah, didn't we? Yeah, we yeah. sort of became experts. Yeah. But um, there is just a difference. I mean, let's let's say you know. Um, like being able to hug somebody you really love, like your parent, like if you love your parents, if you're in a good relationship with your parents, you love your parents, but you couldn't see them for two years. And now finally, but you got to zoom them. Like, did you feel the elation when you zoom them? Not really. But when you got to see them in person, I mean, it That's was just true. night and day difference, right? That's true. Yeah, uh, right. You know, grandparents being able to see their grandkid for the first time. Baby was born in 2020. They weren't able to see them until 2021, 2022. Way different than zoom, you know, like here's your grandkid as opposed to being able to hold them and, and touch them and smell them and see them and listen to them way different. So Zoom was all we had. Facebook was all we had. And we all encouraged it. It's, it's all we have right now. But the in-person is the tactile is what really makes the difference. That's what really shoots the oxytocin up. Yeah. yeah. So what are some other ways that we can raise oxytocin? We've talked about hugs. We've talked mm -hmm. about pets and general touch. Are there some other things that that work to raise oxytocin? And what about people that that do live alone and do continue to live alone and they don't have that community or that person in their life or something? Are there other ways to access this oxytocin in our and lives? That is definitely where it could be uh, challenging because if you have somebody in your life, it is the tactile things. It's the hugging, mm -hmm. the kissing, it's the snuggling. Um, it's the, And again, it doesn't have to be sexual. It can, but it doesn't have to be. If you, When you haven't seen your best friend in a while and you hug your best friend, it's like the greatest feeling. Um, and so, yeah. but it, but it can be sexual. Like we know that orgasm, um, whether with somebody or by yourself can also increase oxytocin. We even know um, that when you enjoy, when you were like at a meal, all right, if you're at a meal and you're with your friends and it was a delicious food and it was great conversation, like that increases oxytocin. People will talk about dopamine, which is our reward system, but reward is more like motivation and anticipation wanting more, whereas oxytocin is that safe, I'm loved, I'm bonded. And so it's, it's more of a community thing, whether it's a community of one or a community of, you know, 10 people at Thanksgiving, um, that's what really can increase oxytocin. Now, for the person who is by themselves, maybe doesn't have a community, they, it, it, unfortunately, that is definitely... Uh, much more of a struggle. You can take oxytocin as a, you can have it compounded. Um, I don't think it's an actual pharmacy prescription. And I love at the beginning how you said oxycotton is not the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oxytocin. <laughs> I think you can, I don't think it's an actual prescription at like your typical pharmacy, but I do believe you can get it from a compounding pharmacy. The downside with, with that is that they haven't really found it to be terribly effective in women it seems to be much more affected for mood in men. So um, I have never prescribed it, but I do have colleagues that have, you know, tried it or used it, or prescribed it. It can come as 
something you like suck on or like a nasal spray, you will see oxytocin nasal sprays um, with, with mixed results. So if you were happen to look online and go, oh, I can just get it. It's unfortunately not an immediate, I feel safe, love and bonded. Um, it's very specific when you do the, the compounding. And and previously you had said pets would be a good thing if you were. Pets, yes. Yeah, yes. yes. And <laughs> I, had, I have to tell you guys, I talk to my dog. Oh, I have a family, but I talk to my dog all the time. Yes. <laughs> like, okay, yes. I'm going downstairs for a podcast. I'll be back in a few minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes. Oh, yeah. Yep. I, yep. 100%. Yeah. I, and I joke about, I have on my, the screensaver on my phone um, is not my husband or my family. It's my dog. dog. Because my dog, <laughs> and I tell everyone in the family, okay. my dog is who brings me the greatest amount of oxytocin. I love you all. Yeah. It is the dog that brings me the greatest yeah. amount of oxytocin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, what yeah. about things like acupuncture or yoga or those types of things? Can those Helpful, they can be they can well. be helpful, but if you've um, again, it's that like loved, bonded community, feel good um, experience. So maybe if you were in a community or a group yoga and it like uh, that was and out of the yoga class, you're like that was amazing. You know, you're you're recognizing like oh my gosh, I love all the people in my class. Like I may not know them, but they're it's so I love seeing them every week. Yeah. Um, like those kind of experiences could increase oxytocin going for acupuncture. I would say the average person loves their acupuncture, but they don't probably come out of it saying I suddenly feel loved and bonded and part of a community and, um, you know, joyful. I, a lot of acupuncture is wonderful, but it may not drive up their oxytocin the same way a amazing hug would do so, or sitting with your best friends for hours and having the time of your life. I think it's very different. So touch and tactile is helpful. Massage, right? Yoga, acupuncture. Um, and if that's what you have, go for it. I a hundred percent, I encourage it, but it's not, uh, it's not going to drive up the oxytocin, um, the way that we, you hope for. And if you come out of acupuncture and you're like, well, that was great, but I don't feel, you know, loved and bonded. It's like, that's okay too. <laughs> you, know? you know, if your acupuncture is for your back, like you just may not, you may have your back may feel better, but you may not feel like you've just, full of love. Yeah. Yeah. So are there, so what if let's say somebody may have some nutrient deficiencies, would their body not be able to make oxytocin the way the next person could with the same hug? Are there some nutrients or things? That oh, the that's body a good question. On? That's a good question. Um, I was trying at last, actually last night I was trying to look up on like the genetics of oxytocin to see if like, because with all of our hormones, as we know, and all our brain hormones, like genetics plays a role in this, in our enzymes that make it and our enzymes that break it down. And I actually did not, I did not find very much on oxytocin. And, and I'm sure there is, I know some, there's going to be an expert listening to this, like, well, Carrie, it's this enzyme. Of course it is. It's just not my area of that. It, genetics is not my area of expertise. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I don't know that they're testing for that. Like we can test for the genetics around like estrogen and estrogen detoxification. We can test for genetics around um, like some things that have to do with glucose and insulin and heart disease and things like that, uh, other types of hormones. But I actually don't know. I haven't looked into it, I should say, with oxytocin. All right. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm, if, I'm assuming there is, and I'm assuming you could have a variant that makes you less able to make it. I just don't know that yet. Like melatonin, melatonin, you, you have two steps to get from serotonin to melatonin. And if you have a variant and either of those steps, then you may make less melatonin than the average bear. And I've actually met people who didn't sleep well their whole life since childhood, got genetic testing and found out they were one of the people who just don't make melatonin very well. And so I hmm. would be really, I should look up more about oxytocin. Yeah, we'll have to have you back. Just so I can answer that question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. think I remember reading a little bit about um, vitamin D and C and magnesium being important, but I don't know what those are not important for. So right. 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 you can't really go wrong. See those on the list. Right. Um, but then I've also read some things that stimulating the vagus nerve can also be effective in helping in the production of oxytocin. So. It can be. It can be. Yeah, it can be. Which, so our vagus nerve um, 
is for listeners, I'm, I mean, I know you've talked about it. Like it's the nerve that goes uh, from the brain and it kind of like winds its way down your torso uh, into your intestines. And the majority of the signals go from the intestines up to the brain. Um, and then a very small percent goes from the brain all the way down. And so anything that happens sort of intestinally or anything kind of in your trunk area of your body immediately gets sent up to the brain for communication, but activating the vagus nerve. Um, so we do that with things like yoga, with singing, with humming, with gargling, um, can activate or help improve oxytocin. Now I will admit though, and I'm sure you two have tried this. Like if you ever like hummed, a, if you can hum a song or you can, um, gargle, like I've never felt it's not the same. Like petting my dog and gargling just does not give me the same <laughs> outcomes. <laughs> but it's worth a shot if, you know, like if you're really working on it. <laughs> yeah. I just, I wonder, and like you said, maybe genetically there's an issue there, but you know, there's, there are some people that tend to, um, well, I, I would just say like some women who tend to bond easier with their babies than mm -hmm. other women. And mm -hmm. some that seem to mm -hmm. have more of that sixth sense of, be, how to bond with their kids. And mm -hmm. I just wonder if that's a genetic component or not having enough oxytocin to begin with that makes a difference. I don't know, but it seems like yeah. there's, you definitely see differences in people and some people that just crave hugs all the time. And you know, when you see them, they're like, they're going to want to hug. Yeah. And then, you know, yeah. other people are like, Oh no, I'm not going to, they're not right. Gonna, yeah. They're not a hugger. Yeah. So and, and the long thing. huggers, the hug that like you go to let go and they're still like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think with the, with mothers, uh, you know, I think with, you have to feel somewhat safe for oxytocin to make its move. And so, you know, as we know, like a lot goes into motherhood, a lot goes into, mm -hmm. um, the bonding experience. And so if you happen to have a traumatic birth, if you are not in a very safe environment or a safe relationship, um, if you, are uh, post have postpartum depression, you know, the other hormones are not doing so well. Um, you're, you're ridiculously sleep deprived. I know, which is normal, but even more so than you'd expected. Um, I think your stress is really high. You know, some people, some mothers, their stress is actually not that high. Other mothers are, you know, circumstances are so that their stress is extremely high. So I think a lot of that tied in goes into um, bonding, bonding mm -hmm. with the baby. It's I, oxytocin plays a big role, but if you don't feel safe in your postpartum depression and you haven't slept in days, like of course you're not going to feel bonded. You're just trying to survive, and I think that's the big, the big key there. Yeah. So, so uh, oh, go ahead, Kristen. That's okay. I was just kind of wondering, like other potential downstream health effects of not tapping into oxytocin often enough. Are there some other things that. So it's been linked. I'm in, in children. Um, and I, I'm not, pediatrics is not my thing, but you know, you'll read about oxytocin and things like ADHD and you'll read about it with autism or children on the spectrum. I don't fully know the link there, but I know my pediatric friends who that they will compound oxytocin, like uh, nasal sprays or something is maybe part of their um, uh, work with those children. Um, other downstream effects, I mean, I, I because I know it does help us with the fight or flight situation, it's like possible it can help, you know, like lower blood pressure, right? Like it can help glu uh, cortisol increases glucose. So if you routinely feel loved and safe and have oxytocin, your cortisol will drop down. It's possible it can really help your glucose diabetes risk for the future. So I definitely think, um, maybe conventional medicine wouldn't tie all those things together. But when we, when yeah. we look at the end result, which is high blood pressure or you're pre-diabetic or diabetic, and then we start to peel back the layers of like, well, what contributes to that? You know, Oh, it, these things contribute and Oh, look, oxytocin can help reduce those things. Um, and it's unfortunately, you know, there's no, like I said, there's really no pill. There's no pharmaceutical when somebody's like, there's, there is for high blood pressure, but telling somebody, you know, pet your dog more or hug more may seem weird. You know, it's hard for them. Like, really, if I just, that's part of my plan is to have more tactile, you know, touch and love and 
feeling safe, which is, I'm like, yeah, that's why I put it on the end of my treatment plans because it's important. And we forget as adults, we forget that how important that is. We're, we're hug deprived. We're touch deprived in a lot of senses. And I know Chris and I have talked about one of the things that we really admire about you is that you teach the basics. So how important the mm. basics are, it doesn't always have to be an expensive supplement or some kind of fancy protocol. And we are aligned with you in that, that we really believe the simple basic things are really impactful. And I, I don't, you probably find this, but I think a lot of people assume good health is expensive and it can yeah. be, I'm, I'm not denying that, but the, the, you're right. The basics don't have to be expensive at all. And I like to point that out over and over and over again, um, that if you increase your hug quotient for the day, you know, if you are, if you have a partner or a family or, you know, animals like really work to increase your hug quotient a day or oxytocin quotient, like that's free, cheap and easy. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you mm -hmm. can... You can do that. The same for hydration or, you know, going to bed on, at a decent hour, getting off your phone. Like, you know, just some of these things that people go, it seems too easy and it doesn't cost me any money. I'm like, I know it's weird, but it works. I promise. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, that's a perfect segue because um, we're wondering specifically for oxytocin, what are your favorite strategies for maintaining a healthy dose? And this is a PG show. So, you know, other than, <laughs> you know, you know, yes. you know, yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. So are yes. there ways you incorporate all of the things you just talked about into your own life, um, you know, specific to oxytocin, or do you just focus on general healthy lifestyle to support hormones? What's your take? I do both. I absolutely mm -hmm. do both. And as I said, my dog is my screensaver on my phone. And I remind my husband all the time that how much joy the dog brings me. I mean, my husband's wonderful, but I'm there. It's really funny that my, I swear my dog was a human, of course, in a prior life. And so, and he's <laughs> such a personable dog. And so he just brings me a lot of oxytocin. So I've, I've lucked out with him. Um, so that's actually a big way that I increase oxytocin. And again, because I know about oxytocin and I'm a nerd when I'm hugging him and, and loving him and, and telling him, I will say to him, like, you're raising my oxytocin today. Or I'll, his name is Hank, my dog. So I will say, come here, Hank, raise my oxytocin. <laughs> so that's a big one. I've also found um, through the pandemic that um, I have uh, one of my, I live in Portland, Oregon. One of my best friends lives about 30 minutes from me. My other best friend lives about 90 minutes north of me. And so, um, and it, I have another best friend, uh, two in Phoenix, Arizona. And when we all get together, when it's, you know, face to face, hug, hang out, lounge on couches, mm -hmm. I can tell like, my oxytocin is through the roof. Like everyone's just feeling nurtured and, and loved. And, and so that seeing my friends in person, not just texting and calling has made a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, and I know a lot of people are going to go, wow, you didn't really mention your family at all. And my, my feel like, fam <laughs> like family is kind of a given. I was just yeah. trying to think of other ways yeah. that with somebody's <laughs> like, you know, like, well, what, like, sure, you're, of course, your husband, like, what else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what, that's sort of the, the what else that I have incorporated. So now I make a conscious effort to s physically see my friends more as opposed to relying just on phone and text, which I think and our busy life, even pre-pandemic, we just didn't always have the time or build in the space. And now we work really hard to build in the space. I think that's one beautiful thing that came out of the last couple of years mm -hmm. is that appreciation for seeing somebody in person. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, it's yeah. it's such a gift. Mm -hmm. And I, I would think, agree with you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, what we keep coming back to is appreciating our basic needs as humans, mm -hmm. right? And we get so wrapped up in the technology and the busyness every day that we, we neglect our basic needs. And this is just one of several. You mentioned yeah. other ones. I mean, there's sleep, there's basic nutrition, there's getting yeah. sunlight in the right times of the day and yeah. turning off lights at night so we know it's time to go to bed. But, you know, feeling love and feeling um, cared for yeah. in whatever way and generating the oxytocin is another big part of just those basic needs is being a human. And I think we've just gotten so far away from, from being willing to honor those things, mm -hmm. you know, in our lives. So yeah. this is a good reminder for all of us <laughs> to so true. not forget, we, we can't text our way mm -hmm. out of uh, some of these things that we just need because we're human beings. And for some people, maybe who are listening and are like, you know, like um, it was mentioned earlier, like, I, you know, I don't like hugs or I don't do hugs. 
there's that book, The Five Love Languages, you know, which oh, I'm yeah. sure everyone's familiar yeah, with. Yeah. And so um, the, there's, you can read the book or you can take the quiz online for free and it will tell you what your love language is. And so sure, maybe hugs is not your love language, but maybe it's somebody doing small tasks for you without asking. Maybe it's gifts. Maybe when you receive unexpected gifts, it's you light up and you feel elated, you feel loved, you feel cared for, somebody got you a gift. Um, and so maybe hugs isn't it, but if you have your love language met routinely, that will also help. And I probably should have said that at the beginning, but at the end, you're talking about basic needs, maybe think of, oh, right, our love, our, what is your love language? And is your love language getting met? However it is, because that will help. Right. Well, and then like in your relationships, understanding what their mm -hmm. love language is, right? Because mm -hmm. what yours is may not be theirs. And so you can be, you know, expressing the love language you have to fulfill yourself mm -hmm. to the other people in your family or in your relationships, but that may not be their love language of communication, oh. right? Yeah. So understanding yeah. theirs is probably just as important as knowing your own. So, right. I would agree. Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been such a great topic to explore with you. Um, we know you're continuing to spread this, your deep knowledge with practitioners and others in your new role with Rupa and what you do online. We'd love to hear a little bit more about um, what you're doing with Rupa Health and how you're uh, supporting practitioners and what it's all about. Yeah, absolutely. So Rupa Health is a one-stop shopping platform that you can order all of the lab work that you think about. So all the functional lab work that you think about, urine testing, saliva testing, stool testing, even blood testing. So we even do your basic or routine blood work on there. So practitioners love it because um, like when I was in practice, I was lucky enough to have a full-time medical assistant and he spent a lot of time going in and out of portals, trying to find lab work for me when I've ordered them on patients. And so it's really helpful uh, to the business owner who it's one, it's one platform that you just have to log into and you can see everything right there. So Rupa's answering um, kind of a pain point for a lot of practitioners, especially small practitioners, uh, small, you know, it's small practices who don't have a lot of money to put into somebody who could track down all this lab work. And then what my job is, is the head of medical education is, okay, now you have this lab work. What do you do with it? <laughs> like, like if you don't understand hormones, you know, if you don't understand um, the GI tract, the microbiome, if you don't understand mm -hmm. food sensitivities or how the brain works, et cetera, et cetera, then where do you go and how do you educate? And so I now am heading up some big educational projects to help practitioners take that next step or to further their education if they know the basics, but they're looking for something more advanced. So stay tuned for a lot of things being rolled out. Oh, that's great. I just signed up with Rupa not too long ago and have ordered nice. my first few tests through there. It's like having a personal assistant. So I really mm -hmm. love the service. I think it's great. So hopefully other practitioners out there with that need will look into that. And the education is great too. I'm amazed at the depth of the information that is being put out. So congratulations yes. to you on yes. your new role there thank you thank you yeah. yes it's been it's been a, a great platform i'm learning a lot let's put it that way i went from all hormones all the time to <laughs> all of the routes of collection you could think of <laughs> i'm learning everything everything yes yeah well good they're lucky to have you so it's gonna <laughs> be fun you. So this sounds like a good place to wrap up. Um, we know how busy you are and we really want to respect your time. Can't thank you enough for exploring this topic with us. It's been a blast. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, oxytocin is a good one because at the end, you always just feel good. Or, yeah, you know, exactly. feel like, I'm going to go pet my yeah. dog. I'm going to go get a hug. <laughs> exactly. Everybody, yeah, everybody go get a hug. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much, Carrie. We really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for tuning in. And we can't wait to see you next time. Until then, take care. If you'd like to access other episodes or subscribe so you don't miss a beat, you can find us at nanp.org forward slash nanp dash podcast. Membership in the NAMP provides you with a competitive advantage. Whether you're a current practitioner or a student, we want you to become an active, informed leader of the holistic nutrition community and join today at NAMP.org. NAMP is very proud to provide the highest level of professional recognition and validation in the holistic nutrition industry through the board certification and holistic nutrition credential. To earn this valuable designation, candidates must demonstrate an exceptional level of knowledge and understanding of holistic nutrition by passing a board exam and documenting client contact hours. Are you ready to boost your credibility with board certification? Visit NAMP.org today to apply. 
Keep in mind that the information on the NAMP podcast is for educational purposes only and should not be considered medical or legal advice. The NAMP is not liable or responsible for any harm, damage, or illness arising from the use of the information contained herein. By listening to the information on this podcast, you agree to defend, indemnify, and hold harmless the NAMP and all agents. Copyright NAMP, all rights reserved.